Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining my lecture on Chapter 9, The Muscular System, which can be found in the Human Body in Health and Disease textbook by Patton and Thibodeau. Hopefully, reading this little joke made you smile. Research suggests that it takes us about 17 muscles to smile, but it takes 43 muscles to frown. So smile. In a previous lecture, I mentioned that skin makes up 16% of our body weight, while muscles make up 40% of our body weight. And muscles, they enable us to move. And how this happens is chemical energy from nutrients uh, is transferred to protein filaments in the muscles, and this is converted to mechanical energy, which causes the muscle to shorten or contract. In essence, our ability to survive often depends on our ability to adjust to changing conditions in our environment and to maintain homeostasis, and muscles help us to do that. As I said, muscular tissue enables us to move, and when fibers shorten, that causes a contraction that allows for movement and also other processes to occur in our body. And there's three types of muscle tissue, and we're going to talk about those in detail. As we learned in a previous lecture, there are three types of muscle tissues. There's smooth, skeletal, and then a combination of the two, really a hybrid muscle card ca called cardiac muscle. So let's start with smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is also referred to as non-striated or involuntary, or we also refer to it as visceral muscle. Remember, visceral refers to the internal organs. So because it's non-striated, this means that it lacks stripes or striations when we look at it underneath a microscope and thusly appears very smooth in its structure. It's found in areas such as the intestine, blood vessels, and the ureters that uh, transport urine from the bladder, uh, from the kidneys to the bladder. And as we said, it is involuntary. We don't have to think about the movement of our intestine or the movement of our um, urine from kidneys to bladder or the dilation or contraction of our vessels for that matter. Now, skeletal muscle is referred to as striated or voluntary. We can think about these muscles, and as long as the systems are functioning properly, we can move them as we please. These fibers uh, are thick, uh, look like thick strings or striations and are composed of something called monofilaments that contain a protein called myosin. And in a little bit, we will talk about actin and myosin and how those help our skeletal muscles to move. Lastly, cardiac muscle, that hybrid muscle I was talking about, comprises the bulk of the heart. And what is very uh, special to the cardiac muscle is that it contains something called intercalated discs. And these intercalated discs help the heart cells uh, to um, communicate with one another and connect with one another so that the heart can contract efficiently as one entire unit. Here we're looking at an image of what the different types of muscle look like. So the first picture is the smooth muscle, and if you look at it compared to the one on the end, the skeletal muscle, you'll see that smooth muscle is missing those little stripes or striations. Um, and then the middle one is the cardiac muscle, and when we take a closer look at that, we can see that it has those intercalated discs or those connections that allow it to function as one unit. Okay, let's make sure we have an understanding of the difference between the origin of a muscle and the insertion point of a muscle. So when we look at their definitions, the origin of a muscle is where it attaches to the bone that is more stable or fixed or stationary. And then the insertion of a muscle is the point of attachment that actually um, moves. Uh, when the muscle contracts. So uh, let's look at an example. Let's take the biceps as an example. The 
origin of the biceps or the place where it attaches uh, that is more stationary is the scapula. And you can see that in this image here. Let me go ahead and circle it for you. So up here is the origin. This bone that it is attached to is the shoulder blade or the scapula. And you can see that it inserts there in two places. That part is not gonna move when we contract our biceps. Now let's talk about the insertion point. The insertion point we said is the point of attachment to the bone that moves. So down here, we can see that the biceps is, uh, point of insertion is on the radius and the ulna. Uh, and then lastly, the belly. The belly of the muscle is the thickest part. And let me see if I can make an arrow right there. That would be the belly of our biceps. Uh, the other example that's given here is the calf muscle or the gastrocnemius. And the gastrocnemius origin, you can see right here, is um, on the posterior distal end of the femur. And the insertion point uh, by a tendon the Achilles tendon, right, is all the way down here on the heel or the calcaneus. So it's important that we're able to distinguish between a ligament and a tendon. Um, and the way I always remember this, because I have difficulty with this too, is remembering, I can remember the Achilles tendon, and I know where that is. On the last slide, we just discussed that it, um, it is the extension of the gastrocnemius. And so I can remember that that is a tendon, an Achilles tendon. And I know that it extends from the gastroc and attaches to the calcaneus. So um, remember that tendons attach muscles to bone. Now, ligaments are a little bit different. They attach bone to bone. And you can see here the example on the right side. I also gave the example in the skeletal lecture of uh, the, the ligament that attaches the, the ball or the head of the femur into the acetabulum. So ligaments bind bone to bone and tendons attach muscle to bone. So we have arrived at probably the most confusing component of the lecture. And here we're talking about the contraction of muscle fibers. And uh, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to watch the video that I've posted in the content of the course uh, regarding skeletal muscle contraction. So let's first identify the players here. The players are the motor neuron or the nerve, the muscle fiber, and the muscle fiber is divided up into little sections called the sarcomere. There's also thin filaments in the muscle fibers called actin and uh, thick fibers called myosin. The calcium ion is also involved and myoglobin. So myoglobin is an important component because what it does is it stores oxygen. And oxygen is what is needed inside the muscle cell in the mitochondria for the production of ATP. So let's take a look at this model here. And the top left picture is where we're gonna start. And what happens is a signal is gonna come from the motor neuron and it is going to stimulate this process. So when that happens, calcium ions are released and they're going to attach to the thin filament, which is the actin. And when this happens, it causes a change in the actin filament and it exposes their soft underbellies, if you will, and the binding sites for the myosin become available. Now, myosin is just a, that thick bottom purple layer, the thick filament, and myosin is just kind of hanging out. And when the binding site is exposed, ADP and a phosphate are attached as potential energy to the myosin fiber. So what happens is that myosin fiber is going to stretch out and it's going to attach itself to the underbelly of the actin 
and it is going to use that ADP to slide forward. This is where we get that sliding filament model. And so it's going to slide forward and there's bazillions of actin and myosins doing this at the same time. It's not just one, bazillions of them are binding and they're doing this movement all at the same time to create this contraction, the, the sliding movement, all right? So when myosin gets to its point of full contraction, the uh, mitochondria has now an ATP that is full and fully charged and ready to go and that ATP is going to approach the myosin and it's going to attach to it and that ADP and phosphate are going to go away. When the ATP attaches, this causes a separation between the actin filament and the myosin filament and the myosin goes back to its original position. It's kind of laid back and that phosphate has been broken off of the ATP and that stored potential energy is there and that myosin is now ready for the next contraction and the whole process starts over again. I hope this has brought some understanding to the um, process of muscle fiber contraction. So we talked about how we move is by these muscles being attached to bones. And we discussed the insertion and the origin and the difference between those two. And now we're going to talk about the difference between prime movers, synergists, and antagonists. So the prime mover is the muscle whose contraction is uh, mainly responsible for producing a given movement. It's the prime mover. Now we also have synergists, which are muscles that kind of help out in the movement. And then lastly, we have antagonists. And antagonists oppose the movement. So uh, in the muscle world, we always have these competing forces. So let's look at an, at an example of the biceps. So the biceps is going to be the prime mover that moves uh, us in a flexion and uh, type motion. So the prime mover, if the prime mover is the bicep and the synergist uh, is the brachialis that's kind of helping out, the antagonist is the one that opposes that flexion and is going to pull us into extension. So it's working against the movement of the prime mover. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about two different types of muscle contraction, tonic and tetanic. So tonic contraction is also referred to as muscle tone, and a good example is posture. When we are maintaining a good upright posture, very few uh, of a muscle's fibers are shortening at one time. We're basically just maintaining our uprightness. Um, and this muscle tone that tonic contractions give us helps us to maintain posture by counteracting the pull of gravity. So we talked about in a previous lecture how the skin helps us to maintain a homeostatic body temperature. Now let's talk about how muscles play into that. Now, we discussed how ADP and the regeneration of ATP is used in the process of actin and myosin working together to cause a muscle contraction. Now, while some of that chemical energy is used for the contraction, much of the energy is lost as heat. So this heat helps to warm us up and maintain a adequate body temperature. But sometimes when we're working out really hard, that creates too much heat. And that's when the skin is stimulated to do its job and sweat, all right, which helps to cool us down. In the operating room, we become concerned um, with heat loss because the temperature of the operating room is pretty cool, as we discussed, about 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of that, we worry about our patients getting too cold. In the operating room, patients lose heat in three ways, and those ways are through radiation, convection, and conduction. Now, conduction means 
the body is in contact with a surface that is cold and it's losing heat because of that. Now conduction is, um, uh, convection rather, is if you think about a convection oven, how it uses air to kind of circulate the heat. Well, we talked about our laminar airflow and how there's different processes that circulate the air. So that air, cool air moving around is also taking heat from our patients. We also have them exposed to the environment of the OR, which is that last component of losing heat through radiation. So there are many um, mechanisms that we use to help keep our patients warmer in the OR so that there's a, less, a lower risk of hypothermia. Have you ever been exercising and you notice that if you're lifting weights or something that with every repetition, it gets a little bit more difficult to lift that same amount of weight and the muscle starts to feel fatigued, right? So we're going to talk about what is happening inside the muscle cells. So what is happening is your cells uh, in the mitochondria go through a process called cellular respiration. And there's two different types, uh, two different methods uh, that the cells use to make energy for themselves. And the first one is glycolysis. Now glycolysis uses the oxygen and the nutrients that are there to make ATP or the energy that allows the cell to function or do its job. The second process is called the citric acid cycle, which happens without oxygen. So as we are using our muscles, they are using up the existing oxygen and nutrients that is there to perform the process of generating ATPs. When we get to the point where we have exhausted those stores or um, the nutrients and oxygen isn't being replaced uh, in an adequate amount of time compared to how much we're using the muscle, it's depleted the oxygen and the nutrient sources. This is when the mitochondria will shift over to that citric acid cycle, which is referred to as oxygen debt. And this is what produces the lactic acid in the muscle, the burning of the muscle and the soreness you may experience after your workout. Now, what else happens when we're exercising, we, um, we start to breathe faster or have heavier breathing. And this is, be, this is a good example of a negative feedback cycle where the, um, the cells need more oxygen. And so the respiratory system is going to help out by increasing the breathing or facilitating labored breathing to help uh, repay the debt of that oxygen and then this is a uh, the process of how our muscles overcome fatigue the authors of the textbook state it best when they write each part of the body is one of many components in a large interactive system that maintains homeostasis and the normal functioning of one part depends on the normal function of other parts. So um, the respiratory, the circulatory, nervous, muscular, and skeletal systems all play an essential role in producing normal movements, not to mention the nervous system as well. So when there are situations where somebody has a disorder or a condition or a disease that impacts a body system that could potentially impact other body systems. On this slide, we're taking a closer look at the motor unit. The motor unit is composed of the neuron and the muscle cell. And you can see these muscle fibers here, how the nerves are kind of latching on to this fiber. Between the nerve and the muscle fiber, there's a little gap. And this gap is referred to as the neuromuscular junction. And in this neuromuscular junction is a chemical that's going to help stimulate the contraction of the muscle. So there's a signal that's coming down the wire. 
and that needs to be transmitted to the muscle. And how this happens is within that neuromuscular junction, there are chemicals that get released called neurotransmitters. And a good example of a neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. So acetylcholine gets released into that gap and that allows for that transference of the signal and then the result is a muscle contraction. So let's talk a little bit more about muscle stimulus. When a muscle fiber is stimulated, it has to reach a th certain threshold for it to be able to contract. This is called the threshold stimulus. This is the minimum amount of stimulus that a muscle fiber needs to contract. The response that's elicited is called an all or none response, which means it's either going to contract or it's not. Um, this principle can be taken into the operating room regarding medications that the anesthesia pro care provider gives the patient. Medications that they give the patient to paralyze them um, when they're under a general anesthetic actually inhibit the release, some of them, inhibit the release of acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction. And um, there's a little device that they will use um, and they put it to the patient's temple and when they push the button, it, its job is to stimulate the muscle. And uh, they're gonna look for a twitch or a response, right? A contraction of that muscle. If there is no response elicited, then they know that the patient is deep underneath the anesthetic. Now, um, as the patient is starting to wake up and that medication is being um, metabolized by the patient, then that stimulus is going to um, uh, be visible as that patient is waking up. So that gives them an idea of how deep or uh, they are under anesthesia and where they're at in the process of waking up from anesthetic. As promised, we would also cover tetanic contractions, also referred to as tetanus. Uh, that may sound familiar if a person gets tetanus, what happens is there's this sustained contraction or rigidity of the muscles as a result. Now we're going to talk about three different kinds of contractions. Uh, two of them are considered isotonic and then one of them isometric. Now isotonic contractions consist of either concentric or eccentric contractions. Concentric contractions, uh, let's say that uh, we're talking about the activity in the picture here is of flexion and extension of the biceps using a weight. During the upward phase of the exercise, the biceps is shortening. And remember, we talked about how this pulls the forearm up in flexion. So this is a good example of concentric contraction. Opposite of that is eccentric contraction. Eccentric contraction is the biceps in a downward phase of exercise, which is it's lengthening instead of shortening. Concentric shortening of the biceps, eccentric lengthening of the biceps. Lastly, isometric contractions is when there is no movement of the bicep whatsoever. It's not contracting and it's not extending. It's just holding the weight in place. It's like a sustained contraction. It's common knowledge that we benefit from exercise and there are several long-term effects of exercise, um, specifically on the cardiovascular, respiratory, and muscular systems. When we're talking about the cardiovascular system, it actually lowers our heart rate because now our heart is working more efficiently than it ever has before because it becomes more efficient the more we exercise. As a result, stroke, stroke volume is increased and stroke volume is how much the blood the heart can pump out in one pump. 
um, cardiac output as a result increases and the size of the heart also increases. The respiratory system, we increase our vital capacity, which is the amount of air that we can forcibly exhale after minimum inspiration. And we also experience an increased rate of recovery. The muscular system, muscles get bigger, right? They get stronger, they work more efficiently, there are three types of muscle fibers. There are slow fibers, fast fibers, and intermediate fibers. Now fast uh, fibers are called white fibers and they have low myoglobin content. And they're really good for quick, powerful contractions. And this makes sense because if, it, if they're not storing a lot of oxygen, they're gonna get fatigued really easily. The slow fibers, on the other hand, are the opposite. They are called red fibers because they have a lot of myoglobin and they're able to store a lot of oxygen. So that is going to give us sustained strength and sustained efficiency before they fatigue. So weightlifters, for example, would have more fast fibers or use them more uh, efficiently. And then marathon runners, it would be expected because they need sustained stamina that these red fibers would be more developed and function more efficiently. Our body systems suffer when we don't exercise and it, it, it's true now more than ever, sitting at home, uh, we're not out and about a lot. We're taking a lot less steps. We're a lot less active than we were when we were working and going to school and all of those things. And so what's happening? Well, our lungs are producing less oxygen. It's really the opposite of the things that we talked about on the previous slide. Skin isn't getting the nutrients that it needs. It's definitely also not getting the vitamin D that it needs, right? Because we're not probably outside as much. And because the skin's not getting what it needs, it doesn't look healthy, right? Um, and it's not functioning properly. So the, that can um, result in decreased moods, difficulty concentrating, exhaustion, and headaches. Um, when we don't exercise, muscles and joints can become weakened and they can atrophy or waste away. Same with the heart, it's a muscle. It can also impact digestion in that we're not moving around like we should and we're probably not eating as good as we should and the body is not using our nutrients as efficiently, which can lead to stomach and intestinal issues. Other organs, um, because they rely on the functioning of those other systems, can become damaged as well. So now we're going to look at some different uh, skeletal muscle groups and here in this image you're seeing kind of uh, an overview of the most commonly uh, talked about muscles. Um, there are approximately 600 muscles in the human body, give or take. The busiest ones are in the eye where the smallest ones are in the ear and the largest one is the gluteus maximus the hardest working one is our heart which pumps about 2500 gallons of blood a day so here's a good time for you to pause the lecture or um, after the lecture is over please go to the course and practice some of those Wiley anatomy drills there. Um, this will really help you gain a better understanding of where these muscles are uh, and what they do. This slide is showing the muscles of the head and neck. Um, the frontal, temporal, and occipital are all muscles that are in the scalp and the obicularis oculi is the circular muscle around the eye as well as the obicularis oris is the circular muscle around the mouth. This is also a good view of the sternocleidomastoid or the SCM which helps in movement of the head 
uh, yes and no motion. Um, and then there's, a, you can see the trapezius, how it um, attaches at the, um, at the occipital bone, and then it also it traverses down and across the back. Um, again, the Wiley anatomy drills are going to be really great for helping you learn these muscles and where they are. So I mentioned in class previously that to reconstruct a breast post mastectomy, we can do something called a tram flap. If you remember, TRAM stands for transverse rectus abdominis musculocutaneous flap. And here you can get a really good image of those muscles of the abdomen, um, our internal and external obliques, the transverse abdominis, and the rectus abdominis. Muscles can be sprained, strained, inflamed, infected, or diseased. Now the difference between a strain and a sprain is that a strain is a stretch, tear, or rip in the muscle or the tendon. A sprain is a stretch, tear, or rip in a ligament or joint capsule. Now the muscle can also become bruised. If a muscle becomes bruised, we refer to that as a contusion, or if there's some sort of inflammation or infectious process going on, we call that um, myocystitis. Two examples of muscle infections are polio and tetanus. Now, polio is an incurable disease caused by the polio virus, and it can lead to life-threatening muscular paralysis. Tetanus is caused by an infectious disease mechanism as well, and it results in a sustained rigidity and contraction of the muscles. The most common form of muscular dystrophy is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And muscular dystrophy isn't a single disorder, but it's characterized by a group of genetic diseases that lead to skeletal muscle atrophy or wasting away. Now, muscular dystrophy is caused by a gene that's missing from the X chromosome. Now, during fertilization, mom and dad each donate a chromosome. Mom is going to donate an X and dad is either going to donate an X or a Y. Now, muscular dystrophy is considered a recessive sex-linked trait. So what this means is um, because girls receive two Xs, if, it, if muscular dystrophy was only on one X, the healthy X would mask it and symptoms would not be manifested in the female uh, infant. However, if, if mom donates the X with the missing gene that causes muscular dystrophy and dad donates a Y and we get a boy, there isn't a second healthy X to mask the recessive trait. So therefore, we find muscular dystrophy occurring more in males than in females. Myasthenia gravis is a chronic disease that is characterized by muscle weakness, especially in the face and throat. Now, it, uh, most forms of the disease will begin with mild weakness or chronic muscle fatigue, and then as it progresses, it can become systemic. And uh, in the latest progressions of the disease can lead to the inability to, br to breathe and respiratory failure can occur. So what happens, remember how we talked about that neuromuscular junction and how there's a gap between the nerve and the muscle fiber and one of the neurotransmitters that's released in there to allow for the transmission of the signal is called acetylcholine. Well, this is an autoimmune disease that attacks the acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cells. 
at the neuromuscular junction. And therefore, the nerve impulses from those motor neurons are unable to fully stimulate the muscle, and so they um, become droopy or unresponsive. There are numerous examples of surgical applications when we're talking about muscles and tendons and ligaments. One that I've mentioned several times is the tram flap reconstruction, and that's the first two images that you hear on, see on the far left, top and bottom. Um, the top image, we're looking at a normal ACL and then a torn ACL and a reconstructed ACL. Remember the ACL, uh, ACL stands for anterior cruciate ligament, and it is responsible for stabilizing the knee posteriorly. And then the lower uh, picture there that's labeled rotator cuff tear. The rotator cuff is uh, the tissue that's responsible for stabilizing the shoulder joint. And sometimes that cuff, which is attached to the glenoid or the cup of the scapula, will tear away. And um, then we can attach it back to the bone in hopes that it will um, reintegrate with the bone and stabilize the shoulder. And then the last picture is that Achilles tendon rupture, uh, which happens a lot in individuals that play sports like basketball and um, can also happen in like skiing injuries and those kinds of things, but outdoor activities predominantly. And when the Achilles tendon tears, there's a couple things that can happen. It can tear in the middle of the tendon and uh, or it can tear away from the calcaneus. If it tears away from the calcaneus, then we can reattach it to the bone. Or if it um, tears in the middle of the tendon, then we can suture it back together. And a lot of times this is where one of those grafts uh, would come in handy so that we could reinforce that repair. Uh, the unfortunate thing with Achilles tendon repairs is that when we cast or put a splint on the patient to keep them immobile afterwards, we splint them or cast them in the plantar flexed position. And remember, plantar flex is when we're pointing our toe. This relieves a lot of the stress uh, on the Achilles tendon, and so hopefully we're going to get a better repair. However, the recovery is quite intensive uh, due to the extended amount of time that they are plantar flexed. And uh, a lot of times uh, individuals that are involved in sports either uh, never return or it is very difficult for them to regain full motion uh, in their foot and ankle. This concludes our lecture on the muscular system. Remember to identify any muddy points that you have and pre be prepared to discuss them in class. I look forward to seeing you then.